Right, welcome to week two, GB311. Uh, welcome, all of you. Um, this week, we're going to talk about philosophy, ideas, and British politics. Um, of course, major political parties, particularly those in Britain with very long established uh, traditions, uh, are influenced directly or indirectly, and whether they know it or not, by a long uh, history of ideas and philosophers, many of whom are relative, uh, distant from us in time, others much closer to us in time. And often, political parties and their leaders are very conscious of these individuals. They'll quote them when they're seeking to establish their credentials with particular parts of their party. So what we're going to hear about today is the, as we're the, the long, not only the long, but a long sort of lead-in to contemporary British politics, but also those philosophical ideas and indeed individual thinkers who underpin our political system today. And our speaker is Professor Paul Kelly, who is one of the school's pro-directors, but also a distinguished member of the government department. Thank you, Tony. Thank you all for coming along. It's a great pleasure to be here. I always enjoy giving this lecture. I don't know if the audiences always enjoy it, but it's great fun for me. Um, as Tony says, I'm going to talk about philosophy, ideas, and British politics. Once upon a time, um, the study of political ideas was seen as an integral part of the study of political science. And if you sort of go back not that many generations, um, you would have studied British government and politics partly through engaging with some great thinkers from the past. As we've progressed, progressed possibly, I don't know, but um, as we've certainly professionalized the study of political science, we sort of chop things up. So those of you who were doing uh, studying government or other subjects in the school may have studied political theory as a sort of discrete activity, but not connected in the, in the way that was the case in the past to looking at institutions, particularly the political institutions of the British polity. Now, some of what I'm going to do today, following on from what Tony says, is to sort of go back to that rather old fashioned approach, which brings together political ideas, um, theoretical arguments, philosophical positions, and the study of British politics. And the thinkers that I'm going to look at, very familiar names, um, all have a bearing on debates which are fundamental to British politics, perhaps more fundamental to British politics this year than they were last year, to do with the nature of the polity that our politics takes place within. Not just the constitutional structure, but you know, what Britain is. So, let me uh, begin with a brief claim about why ideas matter. Uh, what we have here, two smiling faces, one associated closely with the, oops, with the LSE, Michael Oakeshott. Oakeshott, very famous English political philosopher, professor at the LSE, head of the government department, between 1951 and 1968, shapes a generation of political thinkers and politicians across the political spectrum. But he's best known for his contribution to conservative political thought. Oakeshott is the author of a very famous article on, on being conservative, which is quite surprising if you are a, of a conservative disposition if you read it, because it may not tell you precisely what you'd expect to see from a statement of conservatism. But Oakeshott has been a very inf important figure in, in, in shaping an approach to politics that can be characterized as conservative. He was also enormously close politically and personally two key figures in the contemporary Conservative Party. He was very close to Shirley Letwin, who was the mother of Oliver Letwin. Oliver Letwin, as you will know, is the MP for West Dorset and Minister of State in the Cabinet Office, and he's the kind of 
smart guy who goes round the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister thinking up wonderful things for the Conservatives to be and do um, at the moment. Um, Oakeshott was all, is also a significant influence on another character who we'll see a little bit later on, who often comes to LSE to promote his latest book, Jesse Norman, MP for Hereford and South Herefordshire, written a book on Edmund Burke, um, wrote a book on the big society. So he was one of the thinkers behind that ill-fated or underutilised idea for um, a narrative, a policy narrative for, for conservatism when Cameron came in in 2010. Both Letwin and Norman are explicitly influenced. They, they, they draw um, intellectual authority for their policy prescriptions by referring back to what Oakeshott contributes. The second character here is just for balance sake. This is Michael Frieden, sometime professor of politics at Oxford, an emeritus professor now, currently a professor of politics at Nottingham University. Frieden does something else. Um, he writes very long, dense books on the study of political ideologies. But Frieden is also interesting from our point of view because Frieden is the intellectual source and teacher of characters like Stuart White and Mark Steers. And Mark Steers does for Ed Miliband pretty much what Oliver Letwin tries to do for David Cameron. So in a curious way, their take, Steers and White's take on the nature of politics, impacts on the way in which political ideas are filtered into the policy agendas and so on of the current Labour administration. The whole idea of one nation labour came from Mark Steers, who's probably Frieden's most famous student. Okay, let me jump on a bit. I'm going to say just, just a little bit about the study of politics and then go on and talk about the main thinkers. The reason I'm going to do that is because underlying the question of you know, which thinkers we sort of bring into the story, there's a meta question about how ideas influence or are shaped by or do the shaping of British politics. Now, Oakeshott, Michael Oakeshott, comes from a long and distinguished tradition of political philosophers called idealists. He draws his primary philosophical perspective from Hegel, German Prussian philosopher. Hegel, if, ever, if you ever get the chance to read the um, elements of the philosophy of right, um, refers quite frequently to the experience of, of, of the British state as it was developing in the early 19th century. So Hegel is telling us something about the idea of the state by drawing on the historical experiences of um, mature states of the time, of which one of the most significant is Britain. But at the meta level, at the, at the grander level, Hegel's contribution is more important. Hegel really explains to us, or tries to explain to us, and Oakeshott picks up on this, how ideas and institutions and political practices fit together, arbitrarily, necessarily, contingently, or um, non-contingently. And what he, what he argues is that institutions, ideas, and practices emerge through a complex dialectical process. What drives institutions is actually ideas. It's the, it's the inherent logical struggle between dynamic ideas. So at the heart of every constitution, every politics, every set of institutions, is some animating concept that makes sense of it. So if you want to understand what a constitution is, you, you, you really have to understand the ideas that animate that constitution, not simply the way in the mechanics of it. The mechanics of it cannot be understood without understanding the ideas that animate it. So that's the first thing. Now, 
Oakeshott picks this up with this distinction between philosophy, practice, and tradition. So at the philosophical level, you've got the point about, you know, what is it philosophers are doing? They're, they're trying to give us the framework conditions within which politics works. Okay, what is it to understand? How do we make sense of the totality of experience and so on? When we apply that to politics, we have to think in terms of practices and traditions. Why is that? Because the ideas that we, we philosophically reflect on are always abstractions from the concrete experience of lived historical traditions. All concepts are arbitrary or incomplete abstractions from the particular. So if you want to think about political ideas, they will always be, in some sense, the ideas of some place. There are no really universal ideas. They are always particular. And they're particular to practices and they're particular to languages. And the ways in which we understand those ideas then, the ways in which we understand that politics, is going to be understanding what those ideas are, the dynamics within them, and where they come from. Now, one side diversion from this story is to um, take us to what's happening at the moment in British politics, where we've just had a referendum on whether or not we want to contain the union. We have a substantial political party or a growing political party that wants to take us out of the European Union. We are really talking about who or what we are, and our politics, in some sense, is shaped by that. It reflects, um, or, our, or, 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 or the political op options that we confront, reflect the ambiguities about the nature of what this polity is. What, it is, what is it to be British? And that gets to the heart of the, of the question of, of, of traditions as being primarily ideological constructs, historical constructs and languages. And that's really what we're talking about. We're talking about languages of concepts which grow in a certain place and have a resonance through that. Now, given that... Um, you know, the debate about Europe is part of that. A really good example of this is a fantastic New Zealand thinker, historian called J.G.A. Pocock, who wrote, wrote a book called The Discovery of Islands. One of the things that, that Pocock is interested in is the, is, is the struggle with, or part, part of what he's, he's writing about, is, is why did the British not feel more trouble in integrating into Europe and seeing their own political tradition, in a sense, coming to an end? Why do they not feel what the New Zealanders felt? Now, that could easily go in a sort of Nigel Farage, Little Britain way, but Pocock is probably the most sophisticated thinker I know who actually struggles with precisely this thing. What do we do when we reconstitute ourselves against our history as a different kind of political entity? Is that problematic? What's the politics of it? What are we doing and what, what's left in this idea of a we? So all of those things about the nature of what a polity is and so on are very important in terms of thinking about the significance of ideas. And of course, if ideas in, sense, in some sense are an abstraction of those political traditions, then you have to to pick out the people to talk about, you have to have a kind of conception of the tradition to start with. They, they are self-selecting. Let me uh, move on then to, to pick out some of those key figures. So I want to start with Thomas Hobbes. Hobbes is a good example of a radical reaction to the concerns of those who see politics as simply to do with the way in which a particular historically contingent political community talks about itself. That's Hegel's view, that's Oakeshott's view, that's actually Pocock's view. That's why historians get worried about this. What it is for a polity to exist is that you've got a bunch of people who talk about themselves in a way that characterises a constitution, constitutes themselves as a people and distinguishes them from another people. 
If they talk about themselves in a different way, then they become different. That's the idea. Hobbes, on the other hand, is a rationalist. Hobbes is probably the greatest English political thinker, arguably the greatest English philosopher, although he competes with John Locke for that title. He was born in 1588 and lived on till 1672. And Oakeshott says of him, the greatness of Hobbes is not that he began a new tradition, but that he constructed a political philosophy that reflected the changes in the European intellectual consciousness. Leviathan, like any masterpiece, is an end and a beginning. It is the flowering of the past and a seed box for the future. Now, the, key, the interesting thing here is about it reflects the changes of the European consciousness. So although Hobbes is seen as this great English political philosopher, there's also a sense in which he's somewhat alien from our tradition. And if you read Pocock to any great extent, Hobbes is a foreigner in our political history. But what is Hobbes on about and why is Hobbes important? Hobbes is absorbed into the British political tradition in important ways and he shapes the character of our politics in a whole variety of ways. The, the easiest way to explain Hobbes' story is to look at the frontispiece of the 1651 edition to Hobbes' Leviathan. And you get this wonderful picture of what? That is a state. That's what you see and that's what Hobbes theorises. His contribution is the idea of a single, unified, sovereign state. And he's one of the leading originators of the idea of sovereignty as being unitary and indivisible. So the sort of little... Um, how would you describe that? Anyway, if you look carefully, if, you, if I could ex expand it significantly, the things that make up the character peeping over from behind the hill are actually the bodies of people. The sovereign is composed of the people, ordered in a particular kind of way, but with this head unifying them. And the head is, is a single authoritative will and judgment. What we do in constituting ourselves as a state, what we do in becoming a state, is submit ourselves to a single authoritative will. It's important that this only has this thing only has one head. All right. So the sovereign is a is a person. It's a person made up of individual pe per people, all looking to a head, a single will, but it has precisely that characteristic. And when you have this coherent sovereignty, you have the ordering of everything else. So below it is this lovely um, picture of a peaceful village. Everything's ordered out, gardens, lovely buildings. Um, people are growing things. What they're not doing is what they would be doing in a state of nature, which is being at war one with another. So the contrast between having a sovereign order of this kind is a war of all against all. The choice is always war or sovereignty. Sovereignty guarantees peace and order. So what does Hobbes tell us? Well, he's a rationalist, okay? He's an individualist, he's a constructivist, and he's an egoist. He's a rationalist in that reason tells us we ought to obey the state, we ought to submit ourselves to a sovereign will, to give us all the other things that we might want in life. That's, that's what the picture shows. Okay, all the good things that make human existence bearable is conditional on a sovereign state. The key to sovereignty is will. And will is artificial. It's artificially created by each one of us pooling our subjective wills into this created artifice, the sovereign power. But when we do that, we end up creating by a single alienation of our individual wills, a, a, an order that has the power to command now our obedience. And the key thing about the sovereign is the sovereign is not simply a creation for our own advantage, 
but the sovereign is a will that commands our obedience. Hence the big sword. Okay, we have a duty to obey. Partly because one of the processes of getting the sovereign is a contract where we all promise to do something, but partly because that's what sovereignty is. Sovereignty is the power to command obedience. That's what the state does. Now, in order to do that, the state has to be unified and indivisible. So the important point that Hobbes brings to the story is that the state can have no logical division or ultimate separation of powers. There has to be a hierarchical structure and there has to be a point at which there is no further appeal. Law is the sanctioned will of sovereignty and jurisdiction extends to the limits of that power. Now, if you think of the picture of, of the sovereign, Hobbes is writing this and the, man, the, the um, frontispiece is the 1651 edition of, of the Leviathan. Those of you who know a little bit of English history will know that's not far into the English Civil War and Cromwellian rule, when precisely what the English polity didn't have was a strong state that commanded the obedience of all people. And therefore it had chaos and disorder and all of the bad things that the sovereign um, dispenses with. By imposing law, that law, as I say, is the sanctioned will of the sovereign. And the important point about that is that sovereignty is not determined or, or, or restricted by some higher law of reason. Sovereigns decide whatever they decide. The republic, uh, sorry, the, the sovereign um, state for Hobbes is anti-republican. So we get an, a, an argument that government is of and for, but not by the people. So the people constitute the sovereign body, but they don't have a claim against it in any way. Now, all of those things will, will already start to resonate. I've already suggested that um, you know, we can think about how constitution, the British constitution works, the claims on it, the worry about things like the, the, the European Convention on Human Rights. The Hobbesian agenda, in a sense, gives us a very, very clear perspective on those kinds of debates. Sovereignty can't be lent or shared. It cannot be constrained. We have it, we can give it up, but if we give it up, we create a new sovereign. So there's no ambiguities in this Hobbesian story. It's, it's, it's an all or nothing thing. It can't be divided up without undermining the body politic that it represents. And then the other thing, the final thing that, um, that, that, that is important for Hobbes's story is that we sacrifice liberty for security. The key political good is security, not freedom, okay? We get some freedom back from the sovereign, but what drives the constitution, what drives the polity is security. Now, that's um, a very important contribution to the, the English political tradition. Friedrich Hayek, another very famous figure in this institution some time back, thought that there was something rather peculiar about Hobbes's position in this story. It was the individual liberty which a government under law had secured to the citizens of Great Britain, which inspired the movement for liberty in the countries of the continent in which absolutism had destroyed most the medieval liberties which had been largely preserved in Britain. These institutions were, however, interpreted on the continent in light of, a philosophic, of philosophical traditions very different from the evolutionary conceptions predominant in Britain namely of a rationalist or a constructivist view which demanded a deliberate reconstruction of the whole of society in accordance with principles of reason. This approach is derived from the new rationalist philosophy developed above all by René Descartes, but also by Thomas Hobbes in Britain. So Hayek's point is that actually 
The British polity is represented in a different way, a pluralistic way, one in which liberty, not security, is the key. And Hobbes is the alien imposition. Hobbes is the alien foreign power that asserts the significance of sovereignty above other things, that, it's, that, that, that it emphasizes unity as a condition of sovereignty. What's Hobbes's legacy? Well, Hobbes's legacy is then carried on through another important British political thinker. Here's a lovely picture of Jeremy Bentham. You can actually go and see him sitting in his box at University College in the South Cloister. That is, well, that's, that's all the bits of Bentham we have left. That's his skeleton with his wax head, but his hair is on that if you want to see it. Isn't he taken to a meeting once a year at UCL? Uh, he's around, yeah, yeah, he's around. He's, he's a very fragile figure. His head is actually kept in the head office by the head keeper, so you can actually see his head if you want to. Bentham, too, is a very important figure in British, the British political tradition. He's, 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 a, he's a key figure in the development of utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is often seen as a, as a peculiarly British philosophy. It, it, it's, it's central to the development of... of um, British government practice in the 19th and 20th century. Um, but Bentham is also seen as something of an outsider to the British tradition, somebody who's captivated by foreign philosophical influences and brings those in to the British tradition and imposing a kind of authoritarian structure on the modernizing British state. Now, this is for the purposes of reform in Bentham's case. So authoritarianism doesn't necessarily have to, to be um, politically conservative, it can be radical. But the point is about how the state um, acts and what claims can be held over the state. And that's really the thing that links both Bentham and Hobbes together. Both recognize no higher authority that in some sense constrains their powers to act and what they should or should not be doing. So they're legal positivists. Sovereign will, parliament makes law. Okay, it doesn't discover it. It doesn't follow the law that is inherent in the traditions of a society. It makes it. It wills law to come into, in, in, into place. And it can change it. It can change its mind. It shouldn't do that very often because that has counter-utilitarian consequences, but sovereignty is like that. So the ideas that go into thinking about parliamentary sovereignty in the 19th century reflect some of these Benthamite ideas. That sovereign will is singular, that it is unchallengeable, that it's not accountable to anything outside of itself, that it cannot be divided. Why is home rule such an issue for many people? Because it requires some recognition of division, um, and that's... You know, that's one thing sovereignty cannot do. If it divides itself, it disappears. Why is there such a worry about giving powers out to Parliament? Well, you can, you, you can loan functions, but if you give up sovereignty, you don't retain a smaller bit of it. You don't have sovereignty at all. OK, second tradition. We look at um, John Locke. Locke from the point of view of constitutionalism, is a radical. Um, in many other ways, Locke isn't a radical. Um, but for our point, point of view, he contributes to the development of a radical constitutional tradition. For Locke, government is characterised as political power then, I take to be the right of making laws with penalties of death and consequently all less penalties for the regulating and preserving of property and employing the forces of the community in the execution of such laws and in the defence of the Commonwealth from foreign injury and all this only for the public good. What Locke brings is the idea of a qualified conception of sovereignty. Oakeshott really doesn't like Locke. Okay? Hobbes is a difficult customer, but he's one of Oakeshott's um, big thinkers. It's a philosophical conception that you can get your teeth into, you can see manifested and you can argue with. For, for Oakeshott, Locke is muddled. 
He both asserts the claims of sovereignty, but he also qualifies those. It's a mixed mode, and those mixed modes are inherently unstable. And that brings us to the instability that this idea is reflecting. The idea that we have sovereignty, but we have sovereignty up to certain limits. Those limits are determined by some kind of higher law which determines the, 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 the way in which sovereignty can be exercised and the limits over which, uh, and the limits to which political power can be used legitimately. Remember with the Hobbesian case, there is no legitimacy constraint with, with, with Locke. There are limits beyond which the state acts beyond its, its powers. So Locke starts off with the idea of a law of nature as a law of reason. Reason is that which should be manifested in the exercise of sovereignty. Political society is simply a kind of rational construction to achieve some reasonable goals and, and, and not to go beyond those things. Consequently, government is an agreement to place <coughs> the natural executive power as a trust in a set of institutions which are to preserve the rights of individuals, primarily in Locke's case, property rights. So you get a kind of um, classical liberal vision that emerges from Locke which, where the state is there to protect property and the rights that go with it, life and liberty alongside that, and sovereignty is legitimate up to and only up to the defence of those rights. So what do we get out of that? Well, the obvious, the obvious position that we see coming out of Locke's idea is that states' powers, constitutional powers, are subject to some higher and external appeal. Now, we could manifest that internally, or we could manifest that externally through the idea of international or universal rights which place limits on what the British Constitution can do. The other way of thinking about how this Lockean model might impact on how we think about the British Constitution is the way in which rational reform, progressive reform of the Constitution is being driven to revealing or, or, or matching that conception of politics. There's some rational standard that you can use to check how our constitution actually works. That rational standard is, um, is external to the practices or the, the practices of a political community or the will of the sovereign itself. So this gives us the ideas that underpin constitutional reform. What are those principles? What are the core values that should drive the character, the nature and structure, the provisions of our constitution? For Hobbes, it's whatever works and works forcefully and guarantees us peace and security. For Locke, it's what delivers, um, it's what delivers the common good, the um, interests of the people and the protection of their rights. Within the constitution, we get functional separation of, of, of powers. Now, Locke doesn't really have a strict theory of the separation of powers, but we do see it in the writings of a very important Frenchman who's also a kind of honorary Englishman, Montesquieu, in the 18th century, um, who uh, is writing about, again, how political institutions, constitutions, fundamental laws reflect the national characters of people. We don't have a fully developed sense of nationalism yet, but there's this idea that certain peoples in their practices have um, certain ways of doing things which best deliver um, good government. And the distinctive wisdom of the British or the English character, the Constitution of England, is this division of powers which protects political liberties, the liberties of Englishmen. And it's precisely this, I suppose, which shapes some of the attitudes of Hayek and what he sees Hobbes rejecting. So Montesquieu sees in the English system 
a defense of liberty, and that is what's attractive about it. The tranquility of spirit that comes from the opinion one has of his security, and in order for him to have this liberty, the government must be such that one citizen cannot fear another. Alongside Locke and Montesquieu with his division of labor, um, we have the sort of Lockean that the left like. This is Tom Paine. Tom Paine takes a very similar view to Locke in terms of the idea of government being accountable to the people, being um, constrained by the requirements of recognizing the rights of man, um, the, the constitution being limited to achieving certain kinds of ends, He's a, 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 um, an advocate of a written constitution, but unlike Paine, uh, sorry, unlike Locke, Paine is much less preoccupied with the rights of property, at least in the way in which Locke is, is, is represented as being preoccupied with the rights of property. Locke is often seen as, take the example of C.B. McPherson's famous um, interpretation of Locke's theory, philosophy which Macpherson borrowed from Harold Lasky who was another eminent professor at the LSE. They see Locke as, a, as, as, a, as a, um, uh, um, an apologist for a, for a rising capitalist class. Their preoccupation with defending property is all about the conditions for capital accumulation and the state that follows from that is concerned with you know, developing a particular model of capitalism that we see emerge most, you know, forcefully in the 19th century in, in, in England, you know, reflecting back ideas that you get out of Marx. Paine, on the other hand, isn't concerned with that idea of possessive individualism. He is concerned with property, but he's much more concerned with the property of individuals in their, in, in the fruits of their labours and therefore he is a great um, advocate for the rights of man seen from a leftist perspective, challenging the idea of, of, of a rising capitalist class. So he's a, an advocate of constitutional reform and most importantly of democratic emancipation. If we have the rights of man, rights of women as well, then those rights should be equally recognized in the constitutional order. And if the constitution doesn't recognize those things, then politics is primarily concerned with the extension of those equal rights. So this is, a, this is an, an account of, of radical democratic constitutional reform. And that's what we get from, 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 from Paine. Taking this rational perspective and, and extending and developing its, its, its um, scope. So the institutions of the state are not given, they're not things that we have an obligation to protect, they're not things that we must obey, they are things that we have the capacity and the reasoned capacity to want to develop and change and, and so on. So this is the politics of, of reform. And then finally, to pick out some um, two other very um, interesting British figures, not English in this case. British, Smith is a Scot, Burke is an Irishman, and an interesting Irishman at that. Adam Smith and Edmund Burke. Now, what does Smith and Burke bring to the story? Both of them are anti-rationalists, so Although Locke and, Hugh and, 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 and Hobbes differ, they, they both place emphasis on the idea of reason being abstracted from or separate from the circumstances within which individuals do politics, act as agents. For Smith and for Burke, they're both anti-rationalists. Reason is dispersed through the practices or, or, or um, social structures of, of a people. So you start with the idea of a people and its constitution is really the dispersed practice of that people in action. 
A constitution is a way of doing politics amongst the people who recognize themselves as sharing a common identity and a destiny. Those who are outside of that, none of this has a bearing on. Okay? Those, of, those who are within recognize the claims of authority that being part of this people um, brings. And alongside that, and this is important particularly for the way in which the ideas of Smith and Burke are used by, say, contemporary conservatives, both are thinkers who place priority on freedom. So they, they reject the, lo the Hob Hobbesian view of s security trumping freedom, and they recognize the priority of freedom as the, the animating concept of politics. But where they differ from Locke is they don't see freedom in sense instantiated in a single set of rights. Both see freedom as something that is an institutional and cultural achievement, something that evolves. The rule of law, as I say here, is a practice, not simply a dictate or, or a provision with a constitution. So what that means is the, ru uh, the rule of law is actually an institutional way of doing things that has evolved over time. Now, this is both um, radical in the sense that it draws out the growth of freedom as being the great um, benefit of constitutional government, but it's also conservative because of the way it makes us think about how you do political change. Political change for, for Smith and for Burke is evolutionary. So when we think about constitutional politics, when we think about reform, this is the evolution of a, of a community spirit rather than the application of a set of principles or a set of ab abstract rights that we've drawn down from the, the exercise of our reason. And this is most wonderfully cap captured in Edmund Burke's reflections on, the revolutionary, reflections on the Revolution in France, which is one of the sort of classic texts of conservatism. Um, why is, well, it goes on a lot about the the ungallant way in which Marie Antoinette was treated by a bunch of um, French oiks, and that's, you know, that's appalling. But in a way, it's also a radical text. It's a radical text because it takes on the ideas of people like um, pain, not in the rights of man, because the rights of man is a response to the reflections on the revolution in France, but some of Paine's earlier writings, and those who come out of that radical tradition, particularly people like Richard Price. And the point is to challenge their claims to political authority and their rights to determine what it is that a political community actually wants. In a sense, Burke brings down to everyday practice, the demands of political reform and thinking about what it is that we should or should not be doing and taking it away from the control of elites or parties or small groups who offer themselves as the spokespeople for a politics but who actually you know, disguise their own particular interests in that, in that claim to party. So Burke presents us with um, a rejection, an opposition to rationalist constitutional reform. We have a doctrine of prescription. If it's been around for a long time, then it's obviously got some, something going for it. So reform has to take account of what has withstood the test of time and what has grown up in that way. He celebrates prejudice. Now, of course, prejudice you know, in our world is, is rather, but he uses this in a, in a sort of technical sense. Prejudice is prejudgment. It's, it's the natural feelings we have as part of a political community that certain things should be done in a certain way. It's the things we do before we reflect. And his point there is simply to turn the tables on the rationalists who say we reflect, 
and apply, and our reason gives us the, the principles of action. For Burke, you have to apply reason to something. There has to be something about which you're reasoning, and those are your prejudgments, your prejudices, your, your political beliefs and values. So think of something like constitutional reform. You can start with a piece of paper and you can write down all the things that the constitution could do, or you start with the British state and say it's, you know, it's all over the place. And within its inherent logic, you have bits to work with. So there are certain prejudices about what's in, what's out, how you define the idea of a constitution. There are other prejudices about what's negotiable and what's not negotiable, what we could give away and still remain the same kind of state, what we would give away that would stop us being the kind of state that we actually want to be. Prejudices are those prejudgments that we test through the practice of doing politics and reasoning. And finally, the state is an intergenerational contract. So it's never the case that one group of people in one temporal context have control over what should happen um, and determine how a constitution should be. Instead, it, a state is an intergenerational contract, a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are yet to be born. So we have obligations not only to the future, but in some sense we have obligations to those who've gone before us. Tradition demands certain things of us if we are to be the kind of people that we want to be. So Burke provides us with a narrative of change, a place from which we can contradict, challenge the rationalist tendency of, of Paine and Bentham, and a challenge to the idea that the sovereign and the state is somehow abstract from and a precondition for society rather than, as he argues, is an expression of that society. In other words, the Hobbesians get it the wrong way round, the Burkean, rather like Hegel in Germany, and this, uh, writing a little bit later, see the state as something that, that emerges out of a society that already has its own inherent logic and, and, um, and uh, um, ways of doing things. All right, so those are, those are three big perspectives. Let me just finish off with um, where are we now and how do these ideas um, impact on um, contemporary politics. I'm just going to do something very brief, it's and, and it's really just to pick up the way in which um, a dialogue or a dialectic between the Hobbesian, possibly alien tradition, the Burkean, Smithian tradition, possibly the, 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 the um, position of Locke and, 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 and Paine, the radicals, works its way out in, 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 in arguments about contemporary politics. The challenge for contemporary politics in Britain um, and the sort of thing that animates those who write on it, write about the big society or blue labor or the orange book liberalism and so on, is about you know, what is it that animates, holds together, what's the narrative that makes sense of British politics at the moment. The crisis that they're addressing is a crisis that has its roots in the 1970s when the um, confident and steady expansion of welfare states comes to a juddering halt following you know, um, uh, the crisis in the Middle East and oil prices going up and the, 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 the fiscal crisis of the state as it used to be called sort of kicks in. Politics then changes and you know, rather than seeing the state as the vehicle through which the economy is managed to sustain high levels of employment and so on, you have um, a struggle for uh, what's the purpose, what is, it, what is the purpose around British politics. Now the first response to that is um, the rise of um, Thatcherite conservatism at the end of the, you know, the, the, the hollowing out of, of the Labour government in the late 70s and the replacement by Thatcherism. And Thatcherism sort of unleashes this sort of dynamic spirit of, 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 of freedom and deregulation and all the rest of it, getting rid of nationalised industries and so on and so forth. 
and you have the, the establishment of a process that gradually becomes known as, as, as neoliberalism. Now, around about the 1990s, as we've had a sort of relentless period of, of, of this kind of government, a number of people on left and right, two figures associated with the LSE, Lord Giddens, who is actually speaking here tonight, uh, just after, well, just after I will finish, speak to, finish speaking, and John Gray, who was a, a professor in the um, government department of the European Institute, start to address some of the problems that are developed by, if you like, the inherent logic of neoliberalism which takes us back to some of the concerns that the big thinkers are actually talking about. One of the, the great texts that Mrs Thatcher was supposed to be animated by was, was Friedrich Hayek's Constitution of Liberty. Actually, it's not true that she read this or that she was given it by Keith Joseph. Mrs Thatcher had her ideas, her prejudices, if you like, irrespective of what she would have read in a big book. But Hayek was, was, was presented as one of the sort of rational rationales for a change in politics and was read both on the left and the right. And Hayek brings out this idea of spontaneous order, a, a version of politics as, as a process of evolution through the unconnected individual decisions that you find in, in, in Smith, Adam Smith. And the institutions that emerge from that in, emerge in an evolutionary way. Now, a lot of people, in the first instance, take this as being, you know, the, the inherent logic of the market, and this is going to lead to great things, and so on. What Gray and Giddens start to draw to the attention of the political classes, who are also starting to feel this um, in their own politics, is the danger that turning that sort of Smithian analysis of how political institutions arise into an ideological tool that you then apply to drive policy change has the danger of undercutting the social fabric out of which stable and free political institutions um, work. So, 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 so Gray in particular from the right argues that we, we end up with a kind of neoliberal ideology which pollutes conservatism, which is supposed to be an unideological form of politics. Giddens does something similar from the left as they try and identify a new way of articulating politics. Giddens does this through the third way, which is an attempt to shed traditional statist um, social democratic ideology, but find a way of, of sustaining political communities, free markets, but the protections that social democrats have already have always tried um, to uh, adhere to. And that idea is, or that sort of struggle over the legacy of neoliberalism is where we kind of end up in contemporary thinking about politics, and it's illustrated by these two characters, which I've characterised here as... Uh, New Edwardians, a sort of double act. Lord Glassman, um, Morris Glassman, who uh, it was elevated to the House of Lords by Ed Miliband, draws heavily on communitarian thought and is concerned with trying to create a new language for the centre-left and for Labour policy. Now he's both an embarrassment and, a pol and an important contributor, but he is one of the voices with his idea of, of um, blue Labour who have tried to restructure or provide a new language for the articulation of a Labour politics. Now whether he's been successful or not, of course we'll know in May, um, you know, it really rather depends. Norman, too, does something similar. As I say, he's, he's one of the few true believers about the big society. And the interesting thing about that big society agenda is that he tries to look for an alternative way of making sense of small state conservatism that doesn't involve the sort of slash and burn politics that he, even he identifies as being part of the neoliberal agenda. So moving from the sort of Hobbesian view of an authoritative, unchallengeable, 
state with a single unified purpose to a more pluralistic conception of the state to achieve um, more locally than it achieves centrally through you know, top-down command from Europe. Now, we have a real live experiment going on as to see whether or not they have provided a new language which captures the imagination of the public, um, and we will see the outcome of that experiment in May next year. And on that, I will stop. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, now, I think there may be one or more questions that um, I'm told Liam is ready primed with a question, if Liam is here. Oh, you're right behind me, okay. But, but, well, do you want me to, let me, let me have a go while, while, you're, while the microphone's coming around. I mean, how far do you think, Paul, that, um, I mean, the leaders of our great political parties, obviously the big three at Westminster, but now really five or six across uh, the United Kingdom, seven or eight actually across the United Kingdom, significant political parties, some in the whole of the UK, some in, well, most of them actually only in some parts. Um, do you think that they, in your consciously, I mean, many of them will have been taught uh, the kind of, probably at greater length than we can this evening, about the philosophical underpinnings of the great parties that they now lead. But, I mean, do you think that they're consciously referring back to these principles, or is it a matter of simply themselves in an evolutionary way, picking them up when they studied them and then applying them in a, in a sort, of, sort of Burkean evolutionary way as they go along? Or with Thomas Paine consciously looking at a philosophical underpinning which suggests a different approach to the one normally used within British politics? I mean, I thought, I thought quite hard about this because it, you know, it's, it's part of the agenda of putting together a lecture like this and picking out you know, the thinkers that you're going to talk about. I mean, you know, does David Cameron and Nick Clegg and Ed Miliband really sit there wondering about you know, the arguments of Hobbes versus Locke? Or, or the traditions that emanate from them? And the short answer is obviously no, um, they don't. But, and this, is, this was the sort of allusion to, to the Pocock story and the new Edwardians and so on, there are times in politics when, when in a sense, the tradition itself doesn't provide um, a sort of clear narrative direction. Now, whether or not we're at one of those, whether or not we're at the end of a long period of that kind of um, crisis point for whatever, then you start to see people you know, reaching for the tools to make sense of a new politics. And I think that, that is why, you know, interestingly, people like Glassman, Philip Bond, um, um, Steers for, for, for Ed Miliband, um, you know, political, very uh, philosophical politicians like Jesse Norman. That's why they do reach back to this because there they're trying to say, well, you know, I mean, I, you know, we could write a policy agenda which is a bit less of this, a bit more of that, hand this bit of power to. But what's the narrative that makes it fit together? And then you get big challenges like the, you know, the 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 the, the threat to or from Europe, or the threat to the constitution itself. Oh my God, what happens if the Scots had actually voted yes? What would we do? Are we back with home rule again? It's at those points you do, you do see them start thinking about, hang on, you know, what's non-negotiable here? Um, you know, what is parliamentary sovereignty? Is this something we concede or is this something that we will absolutely not secede? And if you think back to, you know, the debate about home rule in 1912, you know, it was, we, had a, we had a rather decent summer this summer, but Home Rule in 1912, you know, initiated an army mutiny. And it was not impossible, but for what happened in 1914, we could have ended up, well, we did end up with a sort of low-level civil war, but we contained it in Ireland in the, in the late teens and the 20s. But exactly the same issue about where sovereignty is and what, you know, what, what's involved there, 
takes you back to these questions about what's negotiable and what's not. You know, why, why would you worry? You know, if the Irish want to go, why not just let them go? Well, part of the reason, maybe this is a spurious reason, but part of the reason is that this actually changes who we are. It's not just about them. If Scotland want to go, it's not just about what the Scots want. It's about what they leave us with. And that's where these questions about the nature of sovereignty or the opposite of that, the plurality of sites of political power or the idea of continuous traditions and so on start to matter. And that's why, that's why I mentioned Pocock. Pocock is one of the few people who writes sensibly about the kinds of things that Na Nigel Farage talks about. And he writes as, an, as a New Zealander who's pursued his career in Britain and the United States, who just says, you know, here's part of the Anglosphere that suddenly sees the British polity change. Now, you in Britain don't necessarily see how you've changed, but you have changed. You've, you've, you've opted away from the historical British tradition and you've gone to Europe. And what the hell is Europe? Now, of course, there's an answer to that, but at least you know, he's posing the question that we don't always see. But at some crisis point, you do start to see that. And that, you know. Sorry, I mean, he'd see that as a sovereign, a sovereign yes. state, the United Kingdom, joining an institution which, by definition, couldn't, well, arguably is not sovereign even in its own terms. Well, it could become could sovereign. Could become sovereign. But that's the point. In everything changes. So it isn't just that we cede some power, as, as you know, politicians tend to say, well, you, you give something up to Europe and you get something re in return. I mean, maybe that's true. For him, there's, there's, there's the more symbolic point, is that you actually stop being this and you become that. Now, that might be a good thing to do, but be aware of what you're doing. And those are, that's when these sort of big... The fundamental questions come onto the agenda. So actually, I think now they, they probably are more important than they would have been 20 years ago or so. You know, they're very important questions about what it is to be the kind of state we are, you know, are going to be at the, at, at, at the heart of our next election, oddly. Right. You're on. Yes? Yep. Um, I was going to ask, so there's a lot of uh, literature obviously in political science about the ways in which uh, ideas affect public policy yeah. as well as institutions. Yeah. I was wondering what, uh, in, in view of the, uh, the context of um, Britain's history, what would you say makes a good idea? What would you say uh, allows for an idea within the components of that idea to, to flourish and be a, a successful idea? Um, well, I guess it, it, it goes back to the sort of the answer to your question goes back to the sort of meta level point I was probably unhelpfully making at the beginning of the lecture about you know where ideas come from. Ideas work when they have some kind of resonance. What makes a concept or something motivate is when it's recognized as being yours. In other words, you know, the, the ideas that, that work in politics are the ones that draw from our, our prejudgments, our our prejudices, our practice or way of doing things and resonate with that. And that's why you know, it, it's so difficult for politicians to, to be theoretical. Of course, you, know, you can come up with, a, with a, uh, you know, an abstract justification for things, but if you want to motivate people, you have to draw on something that, that, that naturally resonates with them. And therefore, the successful ideas are going to be the ones that are either already in your practice, or at least you can be made think are part of how we do things around here. That's, that's the key, and that's, that's what politicians always look for. Right? Newfangled ideas that come from somewhere else don't resonate, and if you want to criticise your opponent, you say that's what they're doing. But if this is how we do things around here, then everybody thinks that's, you know, that, that in a sense does the motivation for us. Cool. When the is going to be discussed yeah. sort of the liberal tradition and the conservative tradition, yeah. how does nationalism and the way that we think about ourselves and our own sort of you know, British tradition specifically, how does that fit in to those uh, and where we find ourselves now? How where does well? Where did national? Yeah. How did nationalism find its? You're asking how did nationalism yeah. find its way into this evolving yeah. sort of soup of ideas? I mean, it's all you know. Well, it, in, in, in one sense, I mean, this is, this is the interesting thing. In one sense, it's always been there. 
but it was always peripheral. You know, the, the, the Scottish nationalism, the cultural nationalism of Scotland has been around for decades, but it just wasn't that important. But all of a sudden, it seems to challenge the two major parties. But, but ask, I think you're yeah. asking, how does nationalism, I mean, as an idea, not quite an ideology, is it, but yeah. in any society, yeah. I mean, in, the, in Britain, if you could argue it was a nationality, it's self controversial mm. con question, yeah. but... Um, for England or Scotland or Wales or, or Britain, yeah. I mean, in a sense, how, do, how would you explain the, arri the, the, the arrival of nationalism yeah. within this? Is, is it an element in the political evolution or just a subset of it? Or it, It's, I mean, it, it, it arises in, in, in a variety of ways. Um, I mean, if you take the sort of Smithian evolutionary model, um, you know, that, that runs contrary to the idea of nationalism. In a sense, you know, the, 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 the boundaries of, our, of, of us is something that grows, and that, you know, that's obviously as a sort of former imperial state, that's something that British, the British state is quite comfortable with. We're, we're in a sense, you know, different to the French, but we are a universal, um, you know, culture, nation and so on. There's something that everybody can get from us. How nationalism impacts on these stories, I mean, it, it, it's, 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 a, it's an amorphous concept and it, it, you know, it, it's, it's used to achieve different purposes. It's an oppositional stance against something that's being imposed on you. It's a good way of distinguishing yourself from, from the powers that are imposing on you. So, so it's the language of how a, a political entity like the Irish can make themselves different within Britain, you use the language of nationality, but in a sense that only works because you've got a polity, a people in a sense, that bears that. But equally it can be used as a way of stopping things. You know, if you look at Acton in the 19th century, he sees nationalism in a sense as the product of an alien unifying sovereigntist conception of the state, Hobbes's conception of the state, uses this as a way of tying us to, you know, the state. Why should we obey this horrible big thing over there? Because it's ours. What does it mean? It, you know, so you, nationalism, in a sense, is the thing that we create to glue together modern political states when they are not simply an evolution of a people governing itself in accordance with its own practices. So it's a sort of solution to that. And, and somebody like Acton sees the, the idea of nationalism as dangerous because it is this sort of, it's this tool used by absolutist, sovereigntist governments to prop themselves up. Okay, very good. I mean, yes, let's take another question yeah. here. Don't feel you can't come back if you want yeah, to, but yeah. <laughs> Lots of interesting ideas. Uh, I come from a science background and I'm wondering where ideas from, say, behavioural economics or psychology fit into constructing political philosophy. So it seems to me like un understanding of how people relate to authority or the ways in which people can dehumanise other people might be very interesting as sort of principles that are distinct from prejudices, as you say, or pure reason uh, in the way of actually constructing a political philosophy that might be if we actually want yeah, I mean, it, uh, somebody who is interesting on that it, it is Jesse Norman, who 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 is actually a kind of critic of the idea of or some of the aspects of how behavioural economics works. But he's also he also uses some of that in terms of of his focus on on certainly the localist element of 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 of, of the big society, but it doesn't. In his hands and in the way in which um, other political thinkers use um, some of the, the lessons of beha certainly behavioural economics and the politics that goes with it, it doesn't have the radical challenge to contemporary ideological politics that you suggest, that we can use this to construct a way of doing politics that allows us to, to shed tradition and prejudice and so on. It's simply a better understanding of the mechanisms that we already use 
Um, but if we understand those in a more rich way, we're not going to sort of fall foul of a very crude, um, you know, rational actor models of politics, which, which is where the critique of neoliberalism comes in. You know, that just starts off with the view of us all as atomized rational actors, which of course we're not, we never act that way. And in order to do the kinds of things that, you know, rational actor models need us to do, we actually have to have the sort of cultural ties and infrastructure and so on under which you know, it makes sense to, to act rationally. So in that sense, you know, of course there's something to be learnt and you know, the, 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 the policy makers and the big thinkers and the narrative constructors in, in politics you know, don't just look back to you know, some big new language of, or some traditional new language of politics. They do look to, you know, the, the, the recent work that's been done across the social sciences. But if that's going to be part of the language you then take out into the world of political campaigning and policy making, then, you know, the less nerdy and technical you are, the more likely you are to be successful. The more you focus on you know, the latest work of, of you know, the, the most recent Nobel laureate or work that's being done in behavioural science and so on, and just forget it, you know, your, uh, civil servants can do that, but, 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 but not, not politicians. But they do read it. A lot of books are published and a lot of, acad I'm sure a lot of yeah. politicians read books, but you mm -hmm. actually, you're almost saying there, dare I say it, that if they read it, they probably ought to say they read it. I mean, that's per per perilously close to the, what I think you just said. Is that true? Well, yes, but then you... Pre present then, the ideas in a slightly more yeah, user-friendly way. Possibly. I mean, you know, politicians can do that. I mean, you know, um, Norman is a good example. But there's always a risk in British politics in particular that if you read too much... I mean, this is, this is the sort of critique that Ed Miliband and, you know often gets, you know, Stuart Wood is giving him the latest, you know, Doris Kearns Gooding book on, um, you know, um, Roosevelt, you know, that's their summer reading and everyone goes, oh my God, you know, they're just, you know, they're, they're trying to, to run politics as if it's some kind of graduate seminar. You know, you have to be careful how you, how you wear your scholarship in, in, in our politics, but it is, it is done. Um, so, you know, that's a subtle thing, you know, ignorance, stupidity doesn't win votes, but nerdiness and uh, bookishness is really for us, not for, for practical politicians. That's why some of us are here, not out there doing politics. Any? I think. Yeah, so it seemed to me there might be a little bit of an assumption in the lecture that just the practices <laughs> just a, that the practices of government follow from the theorists, whereas it seems to me a lot of the time what theorists write and come up with is actually a reflection of practices that are already out there. Yes. And to the extent that it's the latter, does that not undermine somewhat the importance of philosophy and ideas in shaping um, government and politics today? Well, um, I mean, you make a very good point. Do, do you need to understand Hobbes, Locke, Rousseau, Montesquieu to do politics today? Absolutely not. So in that sense, you're right. I mean, you know, governing is an art in itself. Um, Maybe it helps if you've read Thucydides, I would always say. But, um, no, you know, but, but, but in a sense, I, I think the opposition, maybe I wasn't fully clear, I think the opposition is less stark than that. The language is, I mean, I guess it, it, it turns on what precisely is it that we, 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 we mean when we talk about a polity a state, a subversion of that, a nation, if that's the polity we're talking about. What do we mean by that? And one argument might be that it's a, it's a language of practice, okay? And it's the language of practice that determines the institutional structure of that practice. It's, it's, it's how we tell ourselves that we're doing something and not something else. Right? It's not just buildings, it's you know, that we re-describe um, uh, you know, Middlesex Town Hall as the Supreme Court. You know, it's the same building, different things go in. And what do we mean by the Supreme Court? We mean, so it, it's, it's a language that, that in a sense shapes and determines our practice. Now, that's best fully understood 
I suppose, you know, at some remove from the from from the point of view of doing politics. So you don't you don't as a politician need the philosophy in order to be able to act. But how your actions are understood by yourselves over time and so on is going to bring in some some presuppositions that are taken from that language. Okay, the, the context in which you, you're acting and doing the kinds of things that you're doing. So the point is rather that there isn't quite the stark separation between these broader theoretical questions about the nature of the institutions and the, the, the ideological drivers of the way in which those institutions function and change and what you need in order to be a successful politician. It's that the institutions themselves are part of the problem that needs explaining and the explanation is provided in terms of concepts and those concepts have a history and that history isn't fixed, it's changing. So that's, that's really the point that I'm trying to make here. That, that, that what, however you want to move towards a more positivistic understanding of Britain, you will always be using concepts in a sense that have ambiguous meanings in contexts themselves that have ambiguous boundaries. So there's always that historical, interpretive, philosophical dimension to thinking about the politics that we're, we're dealing with. And presumably, it's a, yeah, I was going to, no, yes, come on. Uh, George, property rights, is there a real fear and danger now? Hang on, can you wait for the mic, the, um, so, we so we can pick up the question? With the protection of property rights, is the current um, trade negotiations where, if it gets through, um, corporations could sue sovereigns? Is the genie out of the bottle? Transatlantic trade. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the, and what, what was the what was the question? So, uh, have you almost gone too far? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, this, this, the, this, I suppose, is a, is is a, is another example of when you start confronting these questions about the nature and limits of sovereignty. What you know, what can be conceded in order for economic gains, and who determines our responsibilities, um, and the limits and of, of the exercise of our power. So, it, it doesn't tell us what the right view is in terms of how we should act in, in relation to this negotiation, but it does confront us with some of the complex implications of you know, what gets given up, and who decides, and what's the legitimacy of the decision, and how, it, how revocable that is, and therefore what we're left with as a, as a polity. Um, do these, does any theory tell us how we should Um, you know, settle our, 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 our stance in, 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 in this treaty negotiation. Well, I don't know. Well, I mean, the state. What the state? The actual state is there to kind of protect it. Then they're actually not the protectors. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that, that's the point about where sovereignty goes. Yeah, I mean, the, the point is not so much about the state, but it's about the site of sovereignty. And the point will be that there's always going to be somewhere, which is probably going to be somewhere else if we do certain kinds yeah. of things. So it's where sovereignty resides, and that seems to be the, the question that, that, that I think is, is of and in, significance in, to, to pick up this, presumably, yeah. The develop the, the more globalized a number of aspects of yeah. and it's not the globalization isn't new but the more globalized the world is yeah. and the need for um, extraterritorial institutions to judge on practice yeah. then even if the in a sense to make that work there is pool sovereignty by agreement yeah. it is nevertheless inevitably chipping away at this notion of sovereignty. I mean, inevitably, is that right? So international organizations will inevitably do this, even if the agreement yeah. 
is voluntary and as with the European Union, you know, we are members of a number of institutions that are in effect beyond our own sovereign limits. Yeah. I mean, it changes the terms of sovereignty, you're quite right. The site of sovereignty. But it also forces us to think about you know, what we've done in terms of ceding sovereign authorities to bodies that then seem to be acting for us but not acting for us. So it's about the implications of, of what we think we've actually done. So you can give an answer to that simply in terms of treaties and the, the formal delegation of authorities over certain kinds of things which you know, gets us into having certain, you know, the EU negotiate for us. Or you can turn around and say, well, that may, be the, you know, that may be the way in which it's represented by the lawyers, but that doesn't seem to resonate with what we think you know, we're comfortable with. Sovereignty, in a sense, can be legalised, but it, 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 it moves about a lot. Yep, question at the back there. Can we... All right, God, is the microphone, can it be removed quickly? Did you the door? <laughs> oh, somebody else got them. <laughs> she went outside. <laughs> Had enough. All right, shout. Go on, shout. All right, says, go, go on. on. Well, the answer, it'll be clear from the answer what the question was. Go on. Um, I'm not going to pretend that I'm pro-British. I'm actually very anti-British as a Welsh nationalist myself. Welsh nationalist? Yeah. Okay. So, for me, the, my perspective on the lecture was um, I found looking back at these theorists, especially people like <clears throat> Hobbes, is a way of kind of um, justifying the way of being quite undemocratic um, by talking about you, you use the example of you know Scottish referendum. What does it mean to us? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that's sort of irrelevant. That's sort of going back to even India in 1945. You know, what does it mean to do with like British status? Um, and even with people using references to Hobbes. Well, obviously, when he uh, was around Scotland and even part of, no. well, wasn't linked with England at all. Yeah. And I would maybe consider um, democracy apparently to be more of a British institution than some of these theorists. Um, and I think sometimes it can be a way of justifying you know, being quite undemocratic myself. So the, the, your point is that the theories provide justifications for being undemocratic. Because it's kind of yeah. saying that the sovereign is sovereign yeah. because it is. And yeah. it kind of just states it as that. Yeah. Whereas how I think the Scots would look at it, as I would look at it, is that... We okay, we're going to have to... I'm sorry. We're going to, just because we're going to overrun. Ah, can okay. you respond quickly? Otherwise I'll try we'll and do, get in trouble with the next... i do that quickly. I mean... The, fr the, fr the frameworks can be both democratic and undemocratic, and democracies can be authoritarian. I mean, it, you know, the question is about the scope and limits of democratic will. There's nothing intrinsically benign about democracies going back through the history. Bentham, who takes, who's a good example of a Hobbesian, is also a radical democrat. I mean, he, he actually thought that there should be unrestricted or should be universal suffrage long before um, um, we had the qualified extension of the suffrage under, under, under the Great Reform Act. So democracy doesn't, that doesn't add anything. It fits into those different models. I mean, you can have undemocratic absolutism, you can have absolutist democracies. Arguably, that's what we have through parliamentary sovereignty, insofar as that's considered to be democratic. You can have you know, pain type radical democracy, egalitarian democracy. But there the argument is that democracy is not simply just about, you know, voting rights. It's, a, it's about a set of civic um, goods that people have. You know, pain is an advocate of, of a citizen income as a condition for genuine democracy. All right, so it's not just enough to have the vote and have party competition and all the rest of it. You have to have a certain amount of, 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 of economic power in order to be able to act. And, and you know, Locke, in the sense, is, is in the middle, can either be a, a, you know, a radical democrat in some respects, talks about the rights of, 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 of individuals, or he can be a class-based politician. So mm. democracy itself isn't, isn't a separate... I will stop. No, I'm sorry. Oh, oh. I'm, we've got another class trying to get in here. Thank you all very much. Thank you, <laughs> Professor Kelly, very much.
sorry, next class, next week, um, Martin Lachlan on the Constitution.